Good afternoon. It is July 19th. I apologize about having to move this to a virtual class. I didn't realize that there was an appointment scheduled for me. Um, talk about that later. So we're going to continue the discussion about atomic matter. We're going to start the heat and thermal equilibrium chapter, and then we'll continue all this on Wednesday and finish out with the law of thermodynamics and stuff like that. So last we left, we were talking about things like the atomic matter and then looking at some properties of solid, looking at density versus porosity. And then I had shown this picture of the bones and show, talked about how these bones could theoretically lead to fractures with they've got that porosity of that bottom bone there. Some other properties of solids we talked about, we talked about ionic bonds, we talked about covalent bonds, we talked about metallic bonds and van der Waal bonds, right? You don't have to know the specifics of each of them, but what you do have to know is that they exist. So if I make up some weird bond like the James bond, you should know that's not one of the real bonds that exist for matter. Elasticity is an important topic. Elasticity, we often think about as the ability to stretch something, right? So like if we got a hair tie here, a lot of people think of elasticity as the ability for this to stretch. But in reality, what elasticity is, is the ability to return to its original shape, right? So when a subject object is subjected to external forces and undergoes change in size, shape, or both, the ability to return its resting shape and size is called elasticity. If I take one end of your car and I pull it apart from the other end, if it doesn't rebound back to its original size, it doesn't have a very good elasticity. So something like a spring can be compressed or stretched. It is very elastic. But cookie dough would be an example of something not very elastic. It can be compressed, but if you stretch it out, it falls apart, right? The only way that you can return its original shape is by squishing it together, and that's not an elastic property. In the human body, some tissues we have are far more elastic than others, right? So what do you think? What do you be more elastic, bones or ligaments? Well, obviously, ligaments are more elastic, right? Because bones, we know, are kind of inelastic, and that makes sense because they give us our structure. So those materials that don't return to their original shape are considered inelastic materials. So looking at the body, right? Bone is the most inelastic tissue in the body. It can handle some tension and compression, but it will break under too much force. Skin is fairly elastic. It can be deformed, right? It can push on my skin. Can be deformed and it bounces back. I can pull on it and it bounces back as long as it's sufficiently hydrated, right? A uh, significant long-term stretch it won't return to its original shape. So those people that end up with like stretch marks from babies and stuff like that, their skin's not actually returning to its original shape. A tendon, somewhat inelastic, same thing with the li ligament. They follow very similar properties, right? It has sensors in it to embed signal which stretches too high and release muscular force to save tension. It may pull free from bones or what's called a bulsing before it'll tear or break. Ligaments are also somewhat inelastic. They provide us with stability in certain joints, right? We may have heard of the ACL or anterior cruciate ligament, posterior cruciate ligament of the knee or the lateral and medial collateral ligaments of both the knee and the ankle, or the, the knee and, well, actually the ankle too, and the elbow. And then we have muscles. Muscles are probably our most elastic and contractile tissue that we have. They can not only lengthen, they can also contract, right? And return to its original resting shape just by kind of relaxing, right? It's difficult to injure muscles, but not impossible. You still can tear and rip muscles pretty easy. So concept application of Elasticity, humans have muscular tissue that's both elastic and contract to increase angular motion at joints. Each joint is acted upon by potentially numerous muscles. Our shoulder joint, when we make any simple movement, is being acted upon by multiple muscles, right? Just to do short shoulder abduction, we have a ton of muscles that are working because not only is the humerus moving superiorly, but the scapula has to rotate as well. It also has to do a little bit of rotation in it as well. So when that happens, there's multiple muscles working on it. In most basic terms, when a muscle contracts, that is called an agonist, there is an opposite muscle, it relaxes, called the antagonist. So if I do a bicep curl, right? My biceps is my primary muscle that moves, but my tricep has to relax, or otherwise my bicep won't be able to contract. 
when I extend my elbow, my triceps contract, but my biceps lengthen in order to allow that extension of the elbow. So there's this term active versus passive insufficiency. And what this means is if a muscle can no longer stretch, can't get any longer, it is passively insufficient. So it is moving to its stretch point. If the muscle can no longer contract or shorten, it is becoming actively insufficient because it is being activated. That's the difference between active insufficiency and passive insufficiency. And yes, you do need to know that for your test here in this class. Some of the things we have, we have tension forces, right? Pulling on solids. We can also call these forces traction forces that if I pull on this hair tie again, I'm putting traction on this hair tie. If I take my little stress ball here and I squeeze it, I'm putting compression forces on that stress ball. And so that's pushing things together. We can do the same things with our necks or our spines, right? I can, can, I can put traction on my neck or I can come up here and I can put compression on my neck, right? So either of those are valid. There is another type of force called shear force that occurs, occurs when compression forces are parallel to one another, but going in opposite directions. So for example, if I take these two balls and I move them, I switch them together and pull them across each other, that's a shear force. So for example, if you're sitting and moving a patient across the bed, if they're sitting on that bed and you grab a hold of them and slide them across that bed, there's gonna be some shear force on their butt as they're sliding across the bed. So that first one looks at traction, right? So we have traction here. We got compression. We have shear here. Now, this is a compression fracture over here. And what a compression fracture is, is when the spine itself comes together at too great of a force and leads to the bones cracking and having problems. So that's when somebody may have osteoporosis or something that affects our guess my eye. And that bone collides with each other and those bones end up damaging each other. Here we have shear force to the knee because the tibia is sliding too far anteriorly on the femur, right? That should not look like that. We should have a ligament right there called the ACL that's preventing that, but that ACL is not working very well there. So that's a problem. Arches are another great use of solids, right? Arches are a way of distributing tension and compression forces in an arch design, right? When you think of a bridge, right? When you think of a bridge, a lot of times, bridges will use arches, right? So here's a bridge going across a waterway, right? Where's the waterway? There's the bridge. A lot of times above that bridge, there will be arch supports, right? And what those arch supports do is distribute that force of compression from the cars across a large area. The human body itself has one particularly notable arch system, and that's the foot. We have a little bit of an arch of the hand too that we can use, but primarily it's the foot that has arches in it, right? The arch of the force is foot is considered a windless system or a windlass system. As the toes extend, the tissue on the bottom of the foot puts tension on the walls of the arch and raises it. This increases the stability of the foot and provides a redistribution of the forces of the foot while walking, right? Because as we walk, we cause all kinds of compression and tension forces on the foot, which does need to be redistributed. So some properties of liquids now. Let's move off solids and talk about liquids. Liquids have pressure. When a liquid is contained in a vessel and it exerts force against the size of the vessel, this is called pressure. Pressure equals the force divided by the area of distribution. My can of Dr. Pepper here, I have liquid in it. It is putting force against the outside of this can especially because that liquid also has air in it that's aerated, right? It's carbonated. If there's too much force being pressed across that outside of that can, and that can is no longer able to maintain the force, it will explode, right? 
anything submerged in this can. So if I take this, this stress ball again and drop it in a bucket of water, it will experience the pressure of the water as well. When we get in the pool, we experience pressure of the water. Less dense structures may absorb some of the liquid. If I drop this stress ball in versus this plastic ball, the stress ball is going to absorb some of the water. It's going to suck up some of that water. So at the joint itself, we have some of this at play, right? The synovial joint. Right? You probably have talked a little bit about that in anatomy. Synovial joint has a liquid-filled center. We're called synovial center, right? And it's a capsule of inelastic, selectively porous material. An increase in fluid in the space, either from inflammation or injury, can increase the pressure of the capsule. So if I get inflammation in my fingers and those synovial capsules get filled or swollen, then I may not be able to move my fingers as well in the case of something like rheumatoid arthritis. When we put our human body in water, it experiences the pressure of the force of the water, right? And the forces do increase with depth. Some of you may have experienced this when you got in the pool. You didn't think you had to go pee, and then you get in the pool, and you're in the pool for about five minutes, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, whoa, I do have to go pee. That's because of the pressure of the water around you. And we can actually use that pressure to help decrease swelling in some cases with patients. On a small scale, these forces have a notable effect on human physiology. They reduce swelling, right, by pushing the fluid back to the heart to be flushed out and eventually excreted as urine. We also have the property of buoyancy in water, right? So buoyancy is the pressure against submerged object, and we think of it as the ability to float. Objects that are denser in fluid will sink. Objects that are less dense will float. So objects with in size, such as objects with more muscle mass, will sink. Objects with more adipose tissue will float. The volume of the water displaced is always equal to the volume of the submerged object. So when we get in a pool, we change the volume of fluid in the, in the pool because we have taken up space. We've taken up space in that pool. That water has to move accordingly. This ties into Archimedes' principle. Archimedes' principle says an immersed object is buoyed up or pushed up by a force equal to the weight of the fluid it displaces. So that means we're pushed up with the amount of force equal to the amount of fluid that we've moved. Due to the buoyancy of water, we weigh less in water than we do in air, and we can use that to our advantage, right? So people with weaker bones, such as osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a brittle bone disease, or who have restrictions on how much weight they can put on a healing bone, maybe from an ankle replacement or something to that effect, may begin exercising in water well before they can exercise on land. We call that aquatic therapy. This still provides the needed stimulus for bone remodeling, right? Pressure on it while being safer for that patient. Pascal's principle is a change in pressure at any point in the enclosed fluid at rest is transmitted undiminished to all points in the fluid. Pascal applies to both air and water. So in other words, increase the pressure at one end, it'll increase pressure throughout the system. So if I squeeze this can right now, it actually causes the fluid volume to change in it, but it changes equally across the whole volume of the fluid. When I squeeze the stress ball, because the stress ball is a fluid filled stress ball, when I squeeze it, right, the change in pressure on this stress ball is equal across the whole stress ball. If that pressure is beyond the container, like if I was able to squeeze this hard enough to squeeze it and change the pressure so much inside that it's greater than the container can hold, that container will pop, right? It can lead to an escape of fluid that translates into an immediate change of pressure. Pressure will drop suddenly inside this, right? Somebody ever drop a soda? Mm -hmm. Soda. And you get a little pinhole in it or something, or maybe you get a crack in it, and all of a sudden it starts spinning, right? Because all the soda starts spilling out. Or a beer, or and so I hear that that happens. I don't know what beer is, but. When the dam breaks, leaky pipes, irrigation system leaks, any of that happens. In the human body, we can have that same problem with, where we have a burst aneurysm or hemorrhage in the blood vessels. So the blood vessel itself suddenly is no longer to be able to maintain the pressure of that artery or blood or veins, typically the arteries. And that blood vessel bursts. It pops open like a pipe. At that point, blood pressure is going to drop dangerously low because at that point, 
it's going to cause problems and blood's going to leak into the surrounding tissues. The small blood vessel, probably not as bad as something major like an aorta. That would cause major problems. Large progressive ones are going to cause all kinds of life skin problems. So what about gases, Mr. McKeever, right? The Earth's atmosphere that surrounds us is like a big ocean, right? With more pressure at the bottom than at the top. And we know this because when we get in planes, they have to pressurize those plane tubes. Otherwise, we have problems when we fly, right? The higher we go, the less pressure there is. We don't experience the weight of the air because our bodies also have pressure inside them. So our bodies ourselves have pressure inside them that kind of counteracts the force of the air on the outsides of us. What happens if we were to go into space and not be in a pressurized suit? Hmm. Well, there's no pressure in space. So there's nothing pushing in our body because there's no air. But our body has pressure pushing outward. Our blood vessels, there's pressure on our eyes, ocular pressure, there's pressure in our eardrums. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. Like literally our eyes would pop out of our sockets our eardrums would burst, and there's a good chance we'd have aneurysms all throughout our body because there'd be no pressure in the air. So we need our air pressure. Sometimes you can experience this change in air pressure when you go up in a plane or go up a mountain. But you're going up, you're up, oh, 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 oh. And you have to yawn to pop your ears. No, I just mean all of you yawn. That was my trick the whole time, right? You have to pop your ears to equalize the air pressure because your station tubes in your ears help maintain that ear pressure inside your ear. If we take a balloon and fill it up with air, if we take it in a low, uh, low altitude, the balloon may be smaller, but as we take it up in space in the air, it's gonna get larger and larger and larger and larger until it pops. Because the pressure that we put on the inside of that balloon will eventually become greater than the pressure on the outside of the balloon and it will try to escape. We may experience this as we move too quickly when we go up and down in de uh, depth and height, right? Altitude sickness is a big one. I went to Denver a few years ago and decided to run and man, did I get sick because I wasn't ex used to that height. Um, if you suddenly come up from a deep depth, you get what's called the bends, decompression sickness, where literally nitrogen builds up in your blood. So some of the things that we measure that with, we usually measure atmospheric pressure in different measurements. A uh, typical one is a Pascal. One Pascal is our normal air pressure. We may measure it in a bar. Bars tend to the negative fifth Pascals. Uh, technical atmospheric pressure, right? Standard atmospheric pressure. We can measure it in tor. But usually in the United States here, we use what's called PSI, which is pounds per square inch, right? Um, in science, we typically use the Pascal as our measurement of pressure. So does barometric pressure affect humans? Sure, it does, right? You always hear about the, uh, when you're listening to the news, they talk about the barometric pressure going up or going down, right? So fluid compresses less easily than gas. Air is a gas. Most of our body is filled with liquid rather than gas. So the gas is occupying human space and body, including the lungs, sinus cavities, ear canals, digestive system, and the blood contains some dissolved gases, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, right? And so as we change in altitudes, it's going to affect our sinuses, our ears, our lungs, and digestion to some extent, right? Sudden changes in pressure, such as deep sea diving or loss of cavern pressure in an airplane, can be dangerous to a bloodstream. You can actually end up throwing an air clot or an air bubble in your heart or lungs or brain if you change air pressure too quick. That leads us to Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law states that if you multiply the initial pressure times the initial volume, it will equal the final pressure by final volume. So what it says is if I was able to measure this volume of this ball and the pressure that's on it from the air, and then I squeeze it and change its volume and shape, the pressure and volume before is equal to the pressure and volume after, because it's going to talk about the volume, which is the space it takes up. Increase in the volume space will lower the pressure. Increase in the pressure typically lowers the volume space. Gas in general tries to equalize as soon as it as quickly as possible. It flows from areas of high pressure to low pressure to do so, such as wind and storms. If I take a can of pressurized oxygen and I open it, it's not going to stay in the can. That oxygen is going to disperse and spread out through the room quickly. 
winds and storms are great examples of this, right? An area of low pressure will try to, or an area of high pressure will try to move into an area of low pressure to equalize the pressure. Breathing in, we increase the volume of air in our thoracic cavity, which decreases the pressure in our lungs, right? Inspiration is an active process working against the atmosphere. Expiration or exhalation, breathing out, is a passive process. So then we have this term called plasmas. And plasmas are neither solids nor liquids nor gases. It's a fourth state of matter. It is an electrified gas. The atoms that make it up are ionized, meaning stripped of one or more electrons with the corresponding number of free electrons. They're the least, least available state of matter in our immediate environment. But the suns and stars in our universe all contain plasma. The aurora borealis and the aurora australis, the northern and southern lights, are blowing plasma in our upper atmosphere. So layers of low temperature plasma encircle the whole earth, right? We have this layer of plasma that kind of encircles our whole earth and that kind of protects us from kind of bad things coming from space. But occasionally, showers of electrons from outer space and radiation belt enter the magnetic window near earth poles, crashing the layers, producing these amazing streaks of light through the sky. We can use some minor forms of plasmas, things like fluorescent lamps and neon signs, right? When you turn on the lamp, a high voltage between the electrodes of the tube causes the electrons to flow back and forth. These electrons ionize some atoms of gases inside it, forming a plasma. The plasma provides a conducting path that keeps those current flowing. Current activates some mercury atoms, causing them to emit ultraviolet radiation. The radiation causes the phosphor coating of the tube's inner surface to glow with visible light. That's how those different types of lights work. So again, we got a couple different review questions here. Please review those on your own. All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about is temperature, folks. So things are gonna get hot in here, but please keep on all your clothes. Let me get the temperature lecture brought up here and we're gonna go back to sharing screen. All right, so let's talk about some temperature here, folks. So let's raise temperature in here and heat. We're gonna talk about temperature as a scalar, heat, and thermal equilibrium. So we talked about scalars being just a number, right? And vectors being number with the direction. Temperature itself is typically something that tells us how hot or cold a subject is. It is just a scalar. It just tells us where it's at. If temperature is going up or down, that's when temperature becomes a vector. Nearly all matter expands when temperature increases and contracts when temperature decreases. So the example would be a common thermometer measures temperature by showing the expansion and contraction of a liquid in a glass tube. Celsius is the most widely used temperature scale despite the fact that in the United States we use Fahrenheit, right? Zero degrees is where water freezes, 100 degrees is where water boils. We divide those individual spots into degrees. In science, we use Kelvin as the scientific instrument scale right? Separated into singles as well, but they're not labeled degrees. So we do not call zero Kelvin, zero degrees Kelvin. It is just zero Kelvin. Zero is absolute zero, where all matter ceases to move. So zero Kelvin is minus 273 degrees Celsius. So temperature is related to the random motion of the molecules as a substance. In the simplest idea of an ideal gas, temperature is proportional to the average kinetic molecular and translational motion. What does that mean? Temperature is not the measure of the total kinetic energy, but it's the average translational, the average ability of that energy to move. So when I have two liters of boiling water, it's gonna have twice as much kinetic energy as one liter of boiling water. The temperatures themselves though, are both at 100 degrees because that's what it takes to boil water, right? But because the second one has two liters versus one liter, it's going to have more possible kinetic energy there. So when two substances of different temperatures are in thermal contact, heat is gonna flow from the higher temperature substance to the lower temperature surface. Um, my dad used to say this all the time, that when I opened the door, I was letting the cool air out. I don't know if anyone ever heard that. We had air conditioning back where I was. No, I said, 
quit opening that door. You're letting the cold air out. Well, no, technically, Dad, what I'm doing is letting the cold, the, the warm air in to equalize the cold air that's inside the house. That wasn't much better, and you should get something thrown at me by saying that, right? So if you touch a hot stove, the energy enters your hand from the stove because it's warmer than your hand. It's eventually going to try to bring your hand to a thermal equilibrium with the stove itself. If you touch ice, your hand is going to transmit the heat from your hand into the ice until they reach a thermal equilibrium. The direction of spontaneous energy transfer is always from warm to cold. It does not spontaneously flow from cold to warm. So that means heat is energy and transmit or transit, moving from body of higher temperature to one of lower temperature. So if you get nothing else out from this lecture, heat flows from hot to cold. Heat flows from hot to cold. For heat to go from cold to hot, it actually requires the input of additional energy. Once the transfer, the energy ceases to be heat and starts becoming average energy of that object. So previous we called the energy resulting from the heat flow thermal energy to make clear the link to heat and temperature, right? We use the term that scientists prefer, which is internal energy. So once that flow is moved, once I put my hand on that ice and my hand and the ice are at equal temperature again, and we're in thermal equilibrium at that point, heat flow has stopped and we now have equal internal energy in the ice and my hand. So that means when heat flows from one object to another, it's said to be in thermal contact. And when they equate out and become equal on their temperatures, that is thermal equilibrium. Heat will not necessarily flow from a substance with more total molecular kinetic energy or substance with less. That is, there's more total molecules in a large bowl of warm water than a red hot thumbtack. When the tack is immersed in the water, heat will flow from the hot tack to the cooler water, despite the fact that the warm water has technically more kinetic energy because it has a larger volume of water. But the thumbtack is still hotter, so it's going to try to equate out to itself into the water. Heat flows according to temperature differences, the average molecular total kinetic energy for difference versus you know, just how much total kinetic energy you have. A cool lake, large cool lake, something like um, Lake Superior or something like that, has more internal energy than a red hot tack, even though that red hot tack has a higher temperature, because the tack is this big, the lake is huge, right, or stuff like that. So when a thermometer is in contact with substance, the heat flows between them until they have the same temperature. So when you put an oral thermometer in your mouth, it may feel cold to the touch at first, right? And you cease feeling that when it actually starts warming up and equating out to your own body temperature. After objects in thermal contact with each other reach the same temperature, we say the objects are in thermal equilibrium. I think I've said that three or four times now. When an object is in thermal equilibrium, there's no heat transfer anymore. It means they're both at equa equatable temperatures. That's why we read to read a thermometer, we wait until it reaches thermal equilibrium. Same thing happens in those electronic thermometers. When they beep, what they're literally beeping for is telling you that that metal tip on that thermometer has reached thermal equilibrium with the inside of your mouth or the inside of your ear or the inside of your nose or wherever you're testing it from, the inside of your rectum. So that means we need to wait until that reaches thermal equilibrium. Uh, they used to say wait three to five minutes on the traditional old style uh, mercury thermometers or alcohol thermometers, right? A thermometer should be small enough that it does not appreciably alter the temperature of the substance being measured. So if we were to take a thermometer meant for, let's say, a horse and measure our body temperature with that, that would not be equatable because those thermometers are a lot larger than the thermometers we'd use for a human. Same thing if we took a thermometer for a human and used that on a horse, we probably wouldn't get that accurate of a measurement. So suppose we use flame to add one liter of water, add heat to one liter of water and the temperature raises by two degrees Celsius. If you add the same quantity of heat to two liters of water, how much will the temperature rise? Well, because I've doubled the volume, it's only gonna rise half as much because there's twice as many molecules. So it's only gonna raise by one degree Celsius. If we had three liters of water, it's only gonna raise by a third of that. So you're not gonna reach that full two degrees Celsius, that we're not even gonna reach one degree Celsius, you're gonna raise by two thirds of a degree Celsius. So it's gonna be based upon not only the amount of heat added to the system, 
but also the volume of the substance you're raising heat. Internal energy is when a substance takes or gives off heat, its internal energy will change. So as I'm moving around these balls in my hand, my hand is transferring heat to them, right? In addition, translational kinetic energy of jostling molecules and substance, there's also energy in other forms. There's rotational kinetic energy of the molecules. There's kinetic energy due to the movements of the atoms of the molecules. There's potential energy, that gravitational force between the parts of the molecules. So that means all that internal energy, all that energy inside the substance is called our internal energy. Substance contains internal energy, not heat. Absorbed heat may make the molecules of substance vibrate faster. So when we heat up something, it's going to cause the molecules to vibrate. You can see that in boiling water, right? Boiling water starts giving off gas with that steam. Such is the case where ice is melting. Substance absorbs heat without an increase in temperature. Substance then changes phase. The amount of heat transferred can be determined by the measuring the change of what's known as the mass of the substance that absorbs the heat. So heat is energy transferred from one substance to another when temperature difference occurs, right? When a substance absorbs heat, the resulting temperature change depends on more than just the mass of the substance. These little balls that I'm messing with here to keep my brain functional will change differently than this stress ball because of the substance it's made of and the volume, right? The amount, this weight is a lot less, it has a lot less density, right? So it has a lot less mass per volume and this stress ball, I can demonstrate that just by simply how fast they fall, right? So that means in order to quantify heat, we have to specify the mass and kind of substance being affected by that heat. The unit of heat is defined as the heat necessary to produce standard temperature change in the material. The most common used measurement of heat is the calorie. Calorie is defined as the amount of heat required to raise temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius, or one gram of substance. So in case of this, one gram of this stress ball brain by one degree Celsius. That would tell me how much it took to raise it. I'd be able to give it a caloric count. The kilocalorie is a thousand calories. The heat required to raise one temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius, right? Or one gram of water by 1,000 degrees Celsius. That's the heat used in rating foods, right? When you look at, when I look at my um, can here, it's got calories on it. But if you notice, I get that up close enough to can focus. So yes, not on me, right? You see that calories has a capital C. Capital C indicates kilocalories. Most of your food that you consume is measured in kilocalories, right? So when you look at stuff like your, I don't know, an Oreo, an Oreo is gonna be measured in kilocalories because if we said that an Oreo had like, I don't know how much, or 120 calories each Oreo has, I don't know what that is, we'll just say it's 120. Technically that's really saying Oreo has 120,000 calories. That would make us feel worse about our food, much, much worse, right? Both the calorie small c and the calorie big C are units of energy, right? The international system of units, or SI, quantity of heat measured in joules, and the SI is formed of energy. One calorie itself is equal to one joule, or I'm sorry, 4.186 joules. So one calorie is 4.186 joules. One calorie is 4.186 joules. The energy value in food is determined by burning the food and measuring the amount of joules given off by that food. That's literally how they determine the calories of your food. Food and other fuels are rated by how much energy a certain mass of fuel gives off as heat when burned. So which will raise temperature more, adding one calorie or 4.186 joules? Well, they're both the same. One calorie is 4.186 joules. This is like asking which is longer, a one mile or a 1.6 kilometer track. They're both the same quantity expressed in different units. So specific heat 
of a substance is the ability for that substance to store heat, and it depends upon its chemical mixture and composition. Some foods remain hot to the touch much longer than others, right? The filling of a hot apple pie can burn your tongue even when you touch the crust and it's nice and cool, right? I don't ever done that where you take something out like a pot pie I've done before, right? Pot pie, take it out and you cut it, and you're like, ooh, the crust is nice and cool. You cut into it, you take a bite of it, and all of a sudden you melted your tongue. The different substances have different specific, different substances have different capacities for storing internal heat or energy, right? A pot of water on a stove might require 15 minutes to be heated from room temperature to boiling. An equal mass of iron in the same flame might rise to the same temperature only about two minutes. And for silver, it may require less than a minute, right? So we may be able to get iron to 100 degrees Celsius faster than a whole pot of water. So that material requires a specific amount of heat to raise the temperature of that given mass, that specific object by a certain number of degrees. That specific heat relates back to that calorie, right? Specific heat for the capacity of materials, the ability to raise the temperature of one gram of that material by one degree Celsius. Again, Celsius. It can also be Kelvin technically, but Kelvin don't have degrees. It's not by Fahrenheit though. So some different specific heat capacities. So water specific heat, which is what we base calories on, is 4.186 joules, or it's also one calorie. Aluminium or aluminum is 0.9 joules or 0.25 calories. A clay, 1.4 or 0.3. Copper, 0.3. So you can see that those objects with smaller or lower specific heat capacities heat up faster than something like water takes a little bit longer to heat up than olive oil. So we use olive oil a lot of times for cooking, right? Because it spreads out very nice and even. It'd be weird if we use silver or iron for cooking. The nice part about a silver and iron pot is it disperses the heat throughout the whole pot really easily because it has a very low specific heat. So when we talk about specific heat, we used to talk about inertia, right? It's the term used in mechanics to signify the resistance of an object to change a state of motion. Specific heat is like thermal inertia. It's the body, it's the, that, that object's resistance to change its temperature, right? One gram of water requires one calorie of energy to raise its temperature by one degree Celsius or 4.186 joules. It only takes about one eighth as much energy to raise the temperature of a gram of iron by the same amount because the iron has a lot less specific heat. So a quick joke, what's, from, what's the molecular form for water? Well, H, I, J, K, L, M, and O. Why, you might ask? The formula for water is H2O. Get it? H2O. Ah, it's so funny. So the property of water to resist this chain of temperature improves the climate in many places, right? Because the water is a very useful cooling agent, is used in cooling systems for automobiles, other engines, right? Back on the East Coast, we use, instead of water, we typically use antifreeze because we don't want things to freeze. Antifreeze has a lower temperature required to freeze than water because we had water in all of our engines and it got down below 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, the engine block would freeze. So we need something that doesn't freeze like that. But here, water is perfectly fine coolant, right? Liquids of a lower specific heat capacity, temperatures would rise for comparable absorption of heat. Water absorbs heat very well. My computer is sitting here beside me, my desktop. I have a water block in it. Now, typical old, cool, old computers had an air cooler on it, right? There's a piece of copper that transmitted heat up to a giant fan, and that fan blew the heat off the processor, and that's how it cooled it. Well, I've got a water block on mine, and I've got a whole pump system in mine. Why do I have a water block in my computer? Well, because water absorbs heat a lot better and disperses it greater. So that means that my, my actual computer can stay cooler longer. So when I'm doing something like this or gaming, the temperature doesn't go up as much. Uh, still raises my room. It's gone about five degrees since I've been in here today. Water also takes a little bit longer to cool. So it gives off heat a lot slower, right? So water's ability capacity to store heat affects our global climate. Right? That's why we're worried about things with the water levels rising, right? Water does take more energy to heat up than land does. Right? Europe and the West Coast of the United States both benefit from this property of water. Climates vary very differently on the East Coast and West Coast of North America, right? because the prevailing winds travel from West to East. 
On the west coast, the air moves across the Pacific Ocean to the land, right? In the winter, the water warms up that air and it moves up as it moves across the coastal por portions of America, North America. That means that area has a very mild climate. In the summer, that same air moves across that water and that air cools that air. So the west western coastal regions are typically cool, right? San Diego, it's a very mild climate because of this. But if you go inland from San Diego and you get to something like the Salton Sea, it's a very arid, dry, and hot climate because it doesn't have that water there to cool down the air as much, right? On the East Coast, the air moves from the land to the Atlantic Ocean. So the Atlantic Ocean often steals some of that heat from the air. That's why it gets very cold in winter. So land with very specific, low specific heat capacity gets hot in summer, but cools rapidly in winter. Where I'm from, it's very much like that. It gets very hot and humid during summer, but then gets freaking cold in winter. San Francisco is warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer than DC at about the same latitude. Right? The central interior of a large continent typically experiences extremes in temperature more than the exteriors of the, climate, of the continent. So with thermal expansion, most forms of matter, solids, liquids, and gases expand when they're heated and contract when they're cooled. When the temperature of a substance is increased, the molecules jiggle, jiggle faster. I just love that term. They jiggle faster and tend to move further apart in order to give space for that jiggling. This results in expansion of the substance. Gases generally expand or contract much more than liquids. Liquids generally expand or contract much more than solids. Solids typically don't expand or contract all that much. So something like a bimetallic strip, where you have two different types of metal, where they're welded and riveted together, we can use those in something like a thermometer to control a thermostat, right? So when the strip is heated, one side of the double strip becomes longer than the other, causing the strip to bend in a curve. When the strip is cooled, it bends in the opposite direction. That movement of the strip can turn a pointer, regulate a valve, or operate a switch, such as a traditional thermostat. So when you have those old style thermostats, which are really accurate, believe it or not, that are bimetallic strips inside them, they're able to adjust according to the temperature of the air around them. And they kind of bend and twist based upon the expansion of the metal. And they'll hit a little switch inside of it. And if they hit that switch up, that turns the air conditioner on or heat on. If they hit the switch down, it turns it off. That's how those old things work. Now we have all things like nests and electronic thermostats that control all that stuff, right? So that asks us, why is it advisable to allow a telephone line to sag between the poles during summer? So why do we have that kind of gap in summer of those, elect those telephone lines or those electric lines? Well, telephone lines are longer in summer when they're warmer and shorter in winter because they're cooler. Therefore, they will sag more on hot summer days. If the telephone lines are not strong with as much sag in summer, when they contract during winter, they might actually snap. So they have to have that kind of thing. Plus, if they're on full tension when birds land on them, that would cause all kinds of problems. Let's face it, right? So quick joke, and another joke here. How do you catch a unique rabbit? Unique up on it, of course. How do you catch a tame rabbit? Tame way, unique up on it. Those are my bad jokes, right? So water is unique. That's where that came from, right? Why is water unique? At zero degrees Celsius, so at the freezing point, ice is less dense than water. It's a weird substance. So it floats on water despite being a solid. You would think if ice was the solid form of water, it would sink, right? Almost all liquids will expand when they're heated, right? Ice and cold water does just the opposite. Water's temperature of melting point, zero degrees Celsius or 30 degrees Fahrenheit, contracts when the temperature is increased. As water is heated and temperature rises, it continues to contract until it reaches a thermal temperature of about four degrees Celsius. After four degrees Celsius, then it begins to expand. So we typically say that about four degrees Celsius is the most dense point of water that exists. So given the amount of water, it's the smallest volume and thus its greatest density at four degrees Celsius. The same amount of water has largest volume and smallest density in, sol in that form, right? Ice. The volume of ice at zero degrees Celsius is not shown on this graph coming up here, right? So why is that? Well, when water turns to ice, for further cooling causes it to contract. This behavior of uh, water has to do with this crystal structure of the ice itself. 
right? And the structure of how the H2O matches up. Ice, however, has an open structured ice crystal due to the binding shape of the water molecules and the strength of forces binding those molecules at certain angles, right? This is why snowflakes are all unique, right? Water molecules in this open structure occupy a greater volume than they do in liquid state, which causes them to float. When ice melts, some crystals remain in the water mixture, making a microscopic slush that slightly bloats the water. That's why when you get something like a 32 ounce slushy, it's not the same as if you got 32 ounces of the same warm fluid. The warm fluid will actually take up more space than that slushy, which takes up more, less space because it's more dense. Right? And maybe you've had that happen before you let it kind of start melting and it starts kind of filling up the cup more and more. Ice water is therefore less dense than slightly warmer water. When an increase in temperature, most of the remaining ice crystals collapse. The melting of these crystals further decreases the volume of the water. The behavior of water is really important in nature, right? Suppose that the greatest density of water were at its freezing point is true as most liquids. Then the coldest water would settle to the bottom and ponds would freeze from the bottom up. That means all pond organisms, lake organisms, stuff like that would be destroyed during winter months. Fortunately, this doesn't happen. The densest water settles to the bottom of the pond or lake which is four degrees above freezing. The water at the freezing point is less dense and then starts floating up. So that's why the top of the lake will freeze despite the water underneath being still water. Ice forms to the surface while the pond remains liquid below the ice. Most of the cooling in a pond takes place at the surface where it's contacting air. As the surface of the water is cooled, it becomes less dense and sinks to the bottom. Water will float on the surface for further cooling only if it's less dense than the water below. So let's consider upon this initially at 10 degrees Celsius. It can't be cooled to zero degrees Celsius without first pass at four. You can't go 10, zero. It's got to go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That means as it's going down, the water that gets to four degrees Celsius will start sinking, right? And the less dense water will float, and that'll be what freezes, right? So the ice cannot form until all the water in the pond is cooled to four degrees Celsius, which means that takes up a large amount of thermal conductivity. And once that ice forms on the top, that forms like a shield over that four degree ice, ice water below, the slushy water, the really cold water. And that's how organisms can then live because they can adapt their bodies to live in that cold water. So water surface is first to freeze. Continued cooling of the pond will result in the freezing of the water next to the ice. So that means the pond or lake freezes from the surface down. In a cold winter, ice will be thicker and then midwinter, right? Or mild winter. But the very deep bodies of water are never ice covered, even in their coldest winter, right? The water in a lake must be cooled to four degrees Celsius before it reaches lower temperatures. And so if you've got a really huge lake, something like, um, again, Lake Superior, I'm going to use as an example, or the Atlantic Ocean, right? That's why there are icebergs in the Atlantic Ocean, but the whole ocean doesn't freeze because it will require reducing that whole ocean to minus four down to zero degrees Celsius and it has to go by four first. That's because of water's high specific heat and poor ability to contract. That means the bottom lakes and oceans and cold regions stay at constant four degrees Celsius where life can still exist. So I know that was exactly the stuff you wanted to hear about. I know you cared about how a water contracts and how water um, freezes, but it actually is kind of important because we don't have that, that causes problems. So why could that cause a problem here in the world? Well, let's think about it. If the water of the oceans increase because of global warming, right? That means, how do we get our rain? Well, we get our rain by some of that ocean water heating up from the sun's rays hitting it, going up into the atmosphere, forming clouds. Those clouds come over land, the land drops temperature again, the water forms and form rain, right? What happens if we have greater amounts of water? Well, it's gonna require greater amounts of heat to boil that water off and create clouds which means the energy of the sun is not gonna change, but the volume of the water does, right? So that means we're not gonna get as much rain coming over areas like California and the West Coast, which is how we end up with this drought situation, right? There's more water in the Pacific Ocean than there's been in eons. Just look at stuff like the shelves down in Antarctica and the shelves up in Greenland, and you'll see that the ice shelves are melting. It's also gonna increase, obviously, sea levels at the 
areas, and you can see this down in Miami. I don't know if any of you have been to Miami recently, but some of the areas in Miami tend to flood during the day when high tide comes in. So uh, what I'm saying is basically climate change is real, I guess is what I'm saying. We should care about our environment. But anyway, that's it for today. Um, I apologize about not meeting with you guys in person, but we'll see you again on Wednesday. So I'll catch you guys then. Thank you very much. This is Mr. McKeever, Excelsior.